the introduction of metallic money in the age of the Janapadas and Mahajanapadas signifies a marked change in the arena of trade and commerce. Prior to the Janapada period, we have the Vedic period where we do not have any reference to metallic currency. The Rig Veda refers to barter system and of course to commodity money. By commodity money, we mean that a piece of metal or a cow or even a piece of gold was being exchanged for some other things. So, such kind of commodity monies or commodity exchanges were prevalent in the later Vedic period. We have reference in the Shatapatha Brahmana regarding 100 pieces of metals and the term used is Shatamanani Hiranyani. So, which means that 100 pieces of metal were being used for exchange. In the early Vedic period that is in the Rig Vedas, we have reference to a kind of currency which is known as Nishka. Nishka originally meant jewellery, but here when the term is referred to as 100 Nishkas, it means that it was being used as a kind of unit for exchange. The Brihadaranyaka Upanishad refers to the king of Videha, Janaka and it talks about the gift of Janaka of 100 pieces of Pada in a sacrifice. Now, Pada actually meant a quarter. So, the, here we find that we have reference to metal pieces which had several denominations. So, it was it could be a full Pada, it could be a quarter. But even then, these sort of metallic pieces could not be given the nomenclature coin because it was not stamped by a political authority, it did not have a particular weight standard and so they could not be said to be coins. Now what is a coin? A coin has to be of a perfect weight, it has a particular shape, it could be roundish, it could be square and it should be stamped by a authority. And there are also symbols in such coins. So, one has to remember that there is a marked difference between a coin and a money. So, introduction of such coins were found for the first time in, in the Indian subcontinent only during the period of the Janapadas or the Mahajanapadas. The earliest reference to coins is found in Panini. Panini was definitely Primorian, but when he refers to a grammatical rule, he uses the expression that the coins were stamped or he refers to impressed or marked coins during the period of his living. So, it is natural that during the period of Panini, who was definitely Primorian, we had coinage in the Indian subcontinent. Panini's view is supported by another authority, Quintus Curtius Rufus, who in his treatise on Alexander mentions that when Alexander came to India, he was given by Omphis, the king of Taxila, 80 talents of marked silver. The term used is Signati Arjanti. This marked silver could always be the punch marked silver coins which were prevalent in the Indian subcontinent at that point of time. With Panini and Quintus Curtius Rufus, we have another example from the sculptural world. If we look at the Varut sculpture, we have a particular medallion which gives the story of Anathopindaka and his buying of the Jetavana for the Buddha and other monks. In the sculptural representation, we have the picture of Kahapanas, that is Kashapanas, which were being given to Jeta, the owner of the park, for the building of the monastery. The Kahapanas, which are depicted in the sculpture, look like the stamped Panchmark coins. The fact is that this sculpture belonged to the first century BC. But what is important is that from this sculpture, we can know that 
that the tradition of Panchmark coin was prevalent during the time of Buddha was known even in the 1st century BCE. Thus, it is quite obvious that during the period of Janapadas or Mahajanapadas, coinage came into circulation in India. But unfortunately, we do not know the exact date of the emergence of coinage. Joe Cribb feels that the first coinage of the Indian subcontinent were the bent bar coins which were found in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent copied from the Afghan coins which were again copied from the Greek coins. B. N. Mukherjee feels that the bent bar pieces could also have influences from the long silver ingots that were present in the northwestern sub part of the subcontinent during the time of the Persians or the Achaemenids. A hoard of coins have been found from Bhir Mound in Taxila. Bhir Mound is the first layer of the famous city of Taxila and this layer is comparable with the Mauryan period and also the pre-Mauryan period. Now during this uh, excavation, a hoard has been found of a large amount of coins and in this hoard we have 1055 punch mark coins, 33 silver bent bar coins and 79 minute coins. Apart from this, we have two coins which are tetradrachms of the Greek world and then we have one Persian siglos, one coin of Philip Ardias and one coin of Alexander. Now Philip Ardias has been dated to 317 that is the date of his death. So and these coins the coin of Alexander and the coin of Philips were found in a mint condition. So it goes without saying that this hoard was buried around the first part of the or the second part of the 4th century BC. Another interesting find is the Chamani Huzuri hoard from the Kabul region in Afghanistan. There also coins of Greek city-states have been found of around 6th or 5th century BC and along with the coins of Greek city-states we have the bent bar coins and another kind of coin which is known as the saucer shape coins. The Chamani Hazuri hoard also reflects that by the beginning of the 4th century BC this kind of coins which is known as the silver punch mark coins were prevalent in the Indian subcontinent. The age of the Janapadas was very positive towards the circulation of coins because for the first time we have authorities who are ruling over large part of the area. So these authorities were also supportive towards trade and exchange. Therefore, a merchant could peacefully move from one territory to another and this actually projected the trade relations and naturally the rulers of these Janapadas and Mahajanapadas were pro-trade and this helped in the circulation of the money. The term Panchmark was coined by Sir James Princip. For the minting technology, what we find is that in the first place, the metal along with the alloy materials are melted in a crucible. And when they are melted, they are then poured either as a lump or in a big broad sheet cut into stripes or strips. And then these were again weighed, cut into square pieces, sometimes round and then put again in the heat. After that, the dies were punched in these coins. The other method was that if it formed the lump, then the lump was beaten into a flat piece. And these flat pieces were known technically as blanks. So on these blanks or the surface of the blanks, we have dies that were punched. 
single dies separately punched which formed an incus on the top of the metal. Sometimes dies were punched on the obverse as well as on the reverse. But in the earlier period we have coins which have obverse punches and in the reverse sometimes they are blank or sometimes we have one or two dies. But again there are cases where we have a number of small punches on the reverse. So when we look at this technology of minting coins we find that this is also a kind of die struck coins. But this cannot be related to the more sophisticated die struck coins that we come across during the period of Indo Greeks, the Kushans and the Guptas. So it is better to call these coins as archaic die struck coins or punched mark coins. Now coming to the regions of the Janapadas, what we find is that there were specially three series, Magadha, Koshala and Kashi series of coins which were in circulation. But apart from this three series, we had other small Janapadas which were also issuing coins. For example, Panchala, then we have Dakshina Panchala, Uttara Panchala, Shuroshena, Chedi, Avanti. So these kind of Janapadas were also issuing coins and apart from these Janapadas, we have other principalities like Shurashtra, Vanga, Andhra, Kuntala who were also issuing coins. So monetization became a very important part of the economic network and these coins are, were actually copied or were derived from the Koshala Magadha Kashi coins. So they were technologically the same but there were some changes in the symbols and other things. Now regarding the symbols of the punch mark coins, we have innumerable symbols and their varieties. But a special category of coins which are known as the imperial punch mark coins which belong to the Magadha dynasty when Magadha was in the foray of expansion. So in those coins we find that two symbols are very common. One is the six armed symbol and the other is the solar symbol. So the six armed symbol, the solar symbol continue to exist in all the coins and apart from that we have the symbols like small pellets, we have three arched mountain symbols, bow and arrow, human figures. From the animal world we have elephant, then tree and railing, crocodile, scorpion, hare and recently in the Mahastanga excavation from Bangladesh, presently in uh, northern Bangladesh, we have found that Pachmark coins also bore the symbol of a lobster. This was a regional variation which we find in the later Panchmark coins. But of course, these Panchmark coins did not belong to the time of the Mahajanapadas or the Janapadas. Now, when we are talking of the symbols, we find that scholars have tried to interpret the symbols in a very various ways, but we do not have any proper answer to this. So these symbols were actually taken from the animal world, the plant world, and sometimes geometric designs were being used. There are examples of certain localities where you have certain symbols which are characteristic of that particular locality. For example, we have in Koshala a kind of S symbol, the three S's are there and in this three S's we find uh, it is around a circle and so this symbol is characteristic of the Koshala Janapada. But all Janapadas do not have such characteristic symbols. What is to be noted is that the coins of these Janapadas differed from each other in the fabrication, in the metrology and also in the symbols. For example, the coins of, the, of Shuroshena, Kuntalo, Panchala, both Uttar and Dakshin 
Shurashtra, they have coins with only single symbol. Whereas coins of Koshala, Magadha, they have coins with multiple symbols. So these coins were often called local Panchmark coins. Whereas the Magadhan coins, after the period of expansion, has been given the nomenclature imperial coins. Now, since Magadhan coins have been found throughout the part of the Indian subcontinent, it has also been given the nomenclature universal coins. So, both the titles universal or imperial are being used while describing the coins of the Magadhan uh, period. Now, what is interesting is that the imperial Panchmark coins issued by the Magadhan rulers, that is after Ajatashotru or right from the time of Ajatashotru and which reached its zenith during the time of the Mauryas, we find that the five symbols are always present in these coins and they are of very fine execution, very having good quality metals. So, when we have good quality metals with a fine execution, the coins become an object of art. But what is striking is that the common Indian forms, for example, the Ujjain symbol or the hollow and cross symbol, which is very common to the Taxila region, these symbols are not found in the Panchmark coins of the imperial period. Then regarding the difference in the fabrication, we find that sometimes we have coins of very thin fabric. For example, the Banga coins, the coins from the Bengal region. So there we find representation of three main symbols and one was very famous, the ship symbol. So such kind of ship symbols were represented in later coins where we have the cast copper coins of the Shatavahana period. But it is interesting to note that as early as the 4th century, we have the ship symbol in the coins of the Vanga region. Another symbol common to the Vanga region was wheel, but the flan was quite thin and flat. The flans of Avanti coins, Andhra coins were also thin. And in Andhra coins or in the coins of the Asmaka region, where uh, the, both the coins of the Asmaka region and the Andhra were similar, we have the elephant very much represented and it was a common type. Coming to the coins of the Koshalas, we find that the coins of the Koshalas could be divided into two varieties. So one had a larger flan, thin larger flan and with devices in the obverse as well as devices in the reverse, but the obverse was quite battered. This was because you have many devices which were punched in the reverse. But this did not happen in the other variety where the flan was thick. So in spite of having reverse devices, the obverse symbols were quite understandable and recognized. And though we have not been able to understand the importance or understand the idea behind the symbols, what is noticeable is that these symbols had a kind of system, had a kind of order. A very interesting coins uh, co has been found from the Kashi region, which contains four symbols. And out of these four symbols, we have one symbol belonging to the Kashi region and the other symbol belonging to the Koshala region. This is quite intriguing and perhaps this suggests that at one point of time, Kashi and Koshala in unison issued coins. And if you look at the weight standard also, some coins followed the weight standard of the Kashi region and the others followed the weight standard of the Koshala region. Now coming to the weight standard, what we find is that the weight was actually standardized and we have in our texts, for example, in later period, we have Arthashastra who talks about the um, coins of the period and this weight was 57 grains. Normally, Panchmark coins weighed between, a proper Panchmark coin weighed between 
50 to 57 grains, somewhere 52 grains, 54 grains and such. So, and these coins were known as Karshaponos. In Pali literature, we have references to Kahapono, Karshapono. So, from Pono it is Karshapono and the standard weight was used as small red gunja seeds which are also known as Raktika or Krishnala seeds as weights for weighing metals. Scholars differ regarding influences. Some believe that there was a kind of western influence, perhaps Greek or Persian influence in the minting of coins, but most of the scholars feel that coinage in India is an independent effort. So, we might have Bentburg coins in the northwestern part of the subcontinent which were perhaps copied from the Afghan coins, but at the same time we have the saucer shaped coins of comparatively of the same period which give us evidence of coins being largely used in the Indian subcontinent. The coins which have been discussed till now having the different kinds of devices do not suggest any point where we can understand that they were precursor to the saucer shaped coins. So, the saucer shaped coins are taken to be the earliest coins of the period. We have a definite date for the ending of the Panchmark coinage in the Indian context. Here I can refer to an excavation of done by the French archaeologists in Afghanistan. The site is known as Aikhanum in northern part of Afghanistan and the bank of the river Oxus which was known as ancient Amudarya. There a horde of Panchmark coins, late Panchmark coins have been found along with copper pieces, silver pieces of the ruler Agathocles who was the Indo-Greek ruler ruling in Iconum or Bactria at that point of time. The date of Agathocles is 180 BC. Iconum was devastated by the nomads around 130 BC. Therefore, these Panchmark coins found in a datable context from Iconum suggests that it was during the last period of the Panchmark coins and therefore we can safely say that 2nd century BC was the date when we find the end of the Panchmark coins in the north of northern part of the Indian subcontinent. But this sort of punches were being used in South India in a much later period. Now coming back to Magadha, what we find is that Magadhan coins could be typed, uh, could be divided into two broad varieties. One was the local Magadhan coins and one was the imperial coins. The local coins were again of two types. One was the phase when Rajagriha was the capital of Magadha and the other was the phase when Pataliputra was the capital of Magadha. It is interesting that so much of silver coins were found or issued in that period. So, this suggests or the profusion of silver suggests that they were having access to silver mines during the age of the Janapadas. One can remember the Khetri mines in Rajasthan and perhaps the Magadhan power with its large power base could extract resources from the mines to get silver for their coinages. Now, when we look at the coinages of this period, we find that they became with the expansion of the Mauryans, they became widespread and it became the marker of the Mauryan kingdom. But unfortunately, these coins do not have any legends. These are uninscribed coins. So, we have only symbols which do not speak anything. Therefore, there is a confusion 
among scholars that who actually issued these coins. One suggestion is that, that perhaps it could be issued by a political authority or it could be issued by some moniers or merchants who were trying to maintain a particular weight standard, trying to maintain a particular medium of exchange because trade network was very profuse during this period. We had trade contacts with different regions and this necessitated a kind of currency which would be acceptable to others and which should have a specific weight and which should be stamped by some kind of authority with responsibility. So whoever might issue, either it should, it could be a political power or it could be a moneyer. What is significant is that, that it changed the economy of the region. And what is to be remembered is that, that it was only North India which was experiencing this monetization during the age of the Janapadas. In other areas, however, the barter system was still in practice, the commodity money system was still in practice. The final important thing which ushered in with the introduction of coinage was that the idea of usury. So money lending became a part of the profession. Brahmanical literature often decried money lending because they never supported this. And we have that during the time of Buddha, Buddha talks of usury and Buddhist literature praises usury because you have financiers, you have a profession where you have circulation of money and that circulation of money was being used for some merchandise or some for some business. What was the actual rate of the usury or of money lending? We cannot know. But we do know that with the introduction of coinages, many new professions or vocations came into the forefront. So we have an entire establishment of mint, we have moneyers, we have money lenders and the system of usury became important in the age of the Buddha.